Hello, I'm Dejan Markovic from UCLA, and today I will introduce uh, neural interfaces. There are many shapes and forms of neural interfaces, so I'd like to use brain-computer interface as a canonical technology to introduce the idea, then go over examples of translational science and human therapy for neurotechnology, come back to overview of implantable neural interface technologies that exist today, and then talk about next generation closed loop neurotechnology with some opportunities in the future. I would like to take this opportunity to wish UCLA community a happy centennial birthday and honor the legacy of brain computer interface uh, technology that started at UCLA in 1973 by a computer science professor Jacques Vidal who introduced the term brain-computer interface. And in this paper that you see referenced here, he uh, put the outline of brain-computer interface laboratory, which given the technology of the day, uh, needed to be a distributed system. So you can see that uh, there is a experiment room for neurophysiology. And then there is control area here in the middle. And then there is the computer science. So you do a recording of the neuronal activity in the experiment room, go through uh, signal acquisition and decoding, uh, perform decoding algorithms, and close the visual feedback. You can also see that um, there was a computing infrastructure on campus that was available with only four megabytes of memory. And this was the first node of the ARPANET which was the foundation of the internet. So taking these two uh, foundational technologies, the internet and the brain-computer interfaces enabled very interesting translational science. Some of the examples are discussed here. So in 2000, researchers from Duke universities used the recordings from uh, the brain of a monkey and transferred those recordings over the internet to MIT to move a uh, robotic arm. So that was a really interesting demonstration of the uh, translational uh, science opportunity. In 2003, researchers from uh, Professor uh, Nicolelis at Duke uh, had two monkeys, uh, Ivy and uh, Aurora, playing video games and doing uh, navigation tasks uh, as outlined in the uh, foundational work of Professor Vidal and at some point they realized that this whole navigation uh, can be actually done with uh, mind control rather than uh, using the joystick and just uh, gave up on the joystick and used the brain control to do the 2D uh, video game navigation. Uh, and it takes time to go from animal work to human work. So most recent example of the human work in the brain computer interface area is by Stanford University in 2017 where a uh, paralyzed person was able to do typing through direct brain control interface uh, and type on a computer screen uh, through BCI. Now, what's really important to understand in the neural interface technologies and um, BCI is shown an example is that there is a long time from the concept to translation into actual um, uh, human uh, use. So this was um, a technology that was conceived in 1973 and found first in human application in 2002. So this is the popular brain gate neural interface that you can see uh, has an external device that is uh, recording neuronal signals, passing onto a computer for decoding and uh, actuation to substitute the functionality of limb uh, that was uh, affected uh, through uh, injury. And then on the implant side, you see one of the examples of the um, electrode arrays. This is the Utah electrode array, which is convenient for uh, study of the movement disorders. But in some indications, you need a lot more um, distributed access to the networks of the brain. This is one example of that uh, clinical setup for science of human memory at UCLA that has been going for the past two decades. Uh, roughly speaking, where you have, uh, as you can see here, deep implantable neural arrays that are used for epilepsy monitoring of patients for two to three weeks. 
And in terms of technology, other than these implantable electrode arrays that are uh, temporarily placed, you have external devices for the recording and the camera to monitor the behavior. Uh, so this uses a Benke Fried probe that was developed at UCLA that has the ability to record uh, individual units of the human brain as well as large populations. And this is where this clinical opportunity affords the scientific translation because some of these areas overlap with regions that are of interest for uh, the science of uh, human memory in the medial temporal lobe uh, as uh, shown here. So unlike the um, uh, movement disorders where neurons in the same vicinity of the brain do uh, the same function, human memory is non-topographic, which presents the neural interface uh, technology challenge because you have to interface with a lot of places at a very fine grain. And so what you see illustrated here is that two adjacent cells can encode entirely different concepts. And uh, you can use single units to encode specific memories. So this is the video uh, from uh, my colleague, Dr. Itzhak Fried, that shows a variety of settings uh, that uh, you can experience in real life, people interacting with each other, and the response of a single neuron that you can see is quiet and silent um, to these uh, scenes of regular uh, interaction between people until Jerry Seinfeld shows up. And so this neuron only differentiates and responds to Jerry Seinfeld. As you can see here, you can see this clicking of that uh, neuron responding. And also it was found that it responds to characters from the Seinfeld uh, TV show uh, that led to the theory of associative learning. And then you can see going back to all other test videos and uh, situations that this neuron is uh, not respondent to. It was also found that whether you present an image or a text or an audio doesn't really matter that uh, the same neuron responds to all of these kinds of uh, modalities. And again, you can see Jerry Seinfeld shows up and the neuron responds. Um, so now let's talk about therapeutic devices. Um, deep brain stimulation or DBS is a therapy that is efficacious for Parkinson's disease as I will uh, discuss a little bit later. And although this originated in 1952 uh, by a neuroscientist, uh, uh, Delgado, it was FDA approved in 2003. It's the technology that is derived from the cardiac pacemaker technology and the technology that's used for uh, chronic pain regulation that you can see you have a chest device, which is a very bulky device that is implanted. And then you have a cable that is going through the neck and you drop the electrode array to access the brain. Uh, so this is a routine brain surgery. And I'm again using um, examples from uh, UCLA to show that at UCLA it's been done over 500 times. You can look into the YouTube video of this patient who happens to be a famous um, a music uh, person, uh, Brad Carter, to uh, play a guitar during live brain surgery to find the optimal location to control uh, the seizures and be, restore the ability to play uh, music. So you can see that this is a device that is very bulky, very low resolution, only four contacts that is recognizing the brain world at the level of continents, so to speak, and not very smart technology. Now let's talk about some other neural interface technologies. Uh, this is the cochlear implant, which originated as an idea in the 1950s, and it was FDA approved about 30 years later. Uh, so this is a device that, a uh, system that consists of implant device, which is um, uh, interfacing with the cochlea, and then an external device, which has a microphone and the processor to detect sound and convert that into brain uh, signals that are passed on through the transducer that is implanted. In terms of technology, you can see that uh, this device does uh, power transfer through the skin to uh, power uh, the implant. And because of this external device, uh, the adoption for this kind of technology really is uh, challenging. It typically takes 10 years for people to accept the fact 
that this would be the only treatment option available. Another technology which is very interesting technologically, but by far the most challenging perhaps, is the retinal implant, which again originated as an idea in the late 60s, but it was FDA approved only in 2013 to accompany Second Sight. So you see here you have the electrode array that sits on the retina, then you have the implantable stimulator, and then you have the um, RF coil to transfer power from this glass, which is then powered through a wrist, um, the belt attached battery unit. So uh, it is perhaps the most challenging because of the constant displacement of the coils uh, through the eye movement that makes the power transfer in the entire technology very challenging. So now we are in the situation where we are witnessing increasing burden of neurological disease. There are many patients who have spent years trying one medication after another without relief and are at the point where clinicians have nothing left to offer. For those patients who are pharmacologically resistant to medication, one of the most promising approaches is to use deep brain stimulation or DBS technology that I mentioned uh, to address uh, the neurological dysfunction. And DBS technology has been the most efficacious in Parkinson's disease uh, that uh, has shown uh, effects, but this technology does not have the ability to self-adjust or to regulate stimulation dosing without going to see a doctor every couple of months. Uh, similarly, uh, technology for the regulation of epilepsy is pretty much the same thing. It's the, uh, the can and two leads. From the standpoint of neural interface, it's still four to eight contacts and uh, it has very limited ability. Now, the socioeconomic burden in the U.S. alone for treating chronic pain, depression, and Alzheimer's disease exceeds a trillion dollars per year. And these existing technologies, although they were efficacious early on in some of these indications, will not work for a vast majority of uh, neurological disorders because brain operates as a network where multiple regions need to interact in coordination. So this is where epilepsy monitoring, which is the justification, clinical justification for access of these uh, deep uh, brain networks, presents an opportunity and the gateway for uh, de-risking these other indications and in conducting uh, translational science. And to summarize all of this, you can see that uh, we have insatiable need for better technology. We have very limited technology and limited therapy where um, we uh, have a very slow adoption because of the appeal or the lack of appeal for technologies that have been uh, efficacious in cochlear implant and movement disorders, but have uh, shown very little effect in uh, these other network-based indications. So we can treat new indications with all tools. We need to uh, develop technologies that can interact with functional networks of the human brain. Uh, and this is where government uh, comes into play with the investment that has been enabling brain-body interaction. You can see the examples of brain-computer interface, the prosthetic uh, limbs, um, then the EEG caps. But the problem with all of these technologies is that they're not very sustainable, not clinically efficient, uh, and they're fairly bulky and obviously noticed uh, from the outside. So that's where the President's Brain Initiative came. Uh, with a mission to develop new understanding of these network-based uh, uh, systems disorders and develop a platform technology for precise closed-loop therapy in humans suffering from mental health. And the motivation for here for the uh, government was to address the uh, mental health issues in military. And these are the specifications of the program which called for the development of advanced neural interface with up to 200 uh, intervention points uh, um, recruiting uh, technology, uh, medicine, and um, research uh, in animals uh, to, together to uh, yield uh, these uh, platform technologies. So this was the end-to-end -end clinical system that was envisioned uh, to address to this uh, uh, call 
with uh, implantable devices, the corner piece of this um, uh, uh, system, then the uh, intuitive user technology that's synchronized to the system and uh, closed loop algorithms uh, that provide personalized uh, treatment for every patient. So now imagine the possibility to record multiple areas of the brain simultaneously and to self-adjust and stimulate uh, to uh, the areas of interest uh, on a uh, personalized level. That would be a complete paradigm shift in neuromodulation. So we developed a platform technology to uh, implement that idea uh, which consists of the external module and the PC application that programs the implant, the control module that is placed inside the chest, and the aggregation module which uh, manages the signal access from multiple sites, uh, the neuromodulators. So this is the system that was made for uh, research and uh, development for uh, uh, clinical uh, science with the ability to access up to 256 channels of closed loop neuromodulation with modern day technologies for wireless power and data. So the device uh, records uh, multiple locations simultaneously, aggregates data to a hub and sends it to a control module. And in response, the controller sends power and therapeutic stimulation, which is individual to each patient. Uh, these are the highlights of some of the components. Uh, so you see the neuromodulator, which is the world's smallest human grade 64 contact uh, neural interface, which is uh, packaged in a package that is roughly the size of a vitamin pill, which uh, sits on the cranial uh, bone. Uh, and then we have the control module with the electronics uh, for control and uh, wireless uh, data access which meets the manufacturing requirements from uh, one of our uh, industry partners, uh, Boston Scientific. So in terms of uh, where this technology is uh, in comparison with the research, the science and the therapeutic technologies, uh, we uh, specify this technology to be constrained with the um, investigational device exemption uh, compliance for FDA approval. So we advanced the number of uh, interface points to establish the proper interface to diagnose the uh, issue and perform translational science uh, with a low voltage compliance for power efficiency and very large input range sensing that we can do simultaneous recording and stimulation. So more details are available in the reference number uh, nine uh, with uh, details for this comparison table. So in conclusion, neural interface technology is a low volume technology, meaning that uh, there is really no readily available funding for this kind of research uh, as in uh, commercial uh, uh, commodity uh, devices. You also need to be aware that technology starts and ends in a clinic. You can develop the most advanced and amazing technology. If it doesn't really help address clinical issue, it doesn't matter. So that's very important to consider early on. And so clinician driven technology considerations include the requirements for less invasive, which give you lower cost surgery, higher channel count that you can uh, do precise tissue selectivity, higher precision to individualize therapy, to have uh, full duplex sensing and stimulation for responsive closed loop and secure uh, megabit per second plus uh, wireless data for real time access of many uh, intervention points uh, in the brain and modern technology for wireless charging. So now this is just the first layer of the neural interface after which you would need to develop uh, therapeutically viable technology with these features and then downstream uh, utilize the opportunities in combining neural interfaces and data analytics for uh, medical and non-medical social good. These are the references uh, for some further reading, which I hope inspire you uh, to consider research in this direction. Thank you.